QuickBooks Online 2023 invoice without using QuickBooks payment options so we can compare it to the use of QuickBooks payment options. Get ready to earn the skills needed to boost your bank books on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online test company file using the accountant view as opposed to the business view. You can toggle between the two views by going to the cog up top and switching the view down below. We're going to be duplicating some tabs so that we have a couple tabs we can put our reports in and another tab to do our data input. We will do this every time. Right clicking on the tab up top and duplicating it. We're going to right click on that duplicated tab as it's thinking and duplicate it again. This is where our balance sheet and income statement will go. I will typically tab to the middle now as the one to the right is thinking. Go to the reports on the left hand side and then open one of the two favorites here, which will pretty much always be in the favorites. These being our major financial statement reports. First, the balance sheet, and then I will tab to the right and go down to the reports. And this time the other one, the profit and loss, which is also known as the income statement. I'm going to scroll up and close up the hamburger. I will typically just verify the range here. I like to just type it in 010123 tab 123123. I think that's the easiest way to do the data input January to December. It's useful when you're looking at these payments uh, when you're to put in the current date range because that makes it a little bit easier when you're sending out the invoices for the payments if you're testing them out it's a little bit more difficult possibly when you're dealing with payments in other words to try to test something out in the past or in the future in any case we will run this and then i'm going to go back to the tab to the left nothing's in it by the way because we haven't input anything yet as of this point in time balance sheet Closing up the hamburger, same thing. I'm going to go from 010123 tab 123123 and then run that one. So now we have our two financial statement reports tapping to the left. We have our data input on the left hand side. So we've set up our QuickBooks payments. Now note that if you don't have a bank account set up in the banking area, when you first set up your payments, then if you go into your chart of accounts, which is under accounting on the left hand side, then QuickBooks may set up the QuickBooks checking account, which is you can see it has this verify this thing here that shows it's basically a linked uh, type of account. If you have a checking account that is linked, you might be able to set up the QuickBooks payments that are that are tied directly to the checking account that you are using so that's just one thing to be aware of now when i go and actually create an invoice if i go to the in the new button up top and i send out an invoice because i want to be collecting on a payment from a customer uh, you're going to then have the payment options on the left hand side over here now note you might be used to and have like the old layout version of the invoice. They are experimenting with the new layout version of the data input on the invoice. In essence, the data input would should be much the same for the two versions of the invoice. Uh, this one's still, I guess, kind of in beta. There's a couple things that may not work if you're using some other uh, functions like some like class tracking and whatnot. They might be integrated now, but there's a couple things that I was experimenting with. They, they haven't fully put in place with this new format of the invoice, but this looks to be the way they're trying to move towards. But if you want to go to the old layout, you can have the old layout up top. You will still have similar kind of, of payment options, just the layout will be looking different. So these options are now here because we turned on the uh, QuickBooks payments. Now, of course, if we have these payment options on, then when they pay us using these payment options, we're going to be subject to these fines, which they nicely put in here for us. So the credit card 
2.9% plus uh, 25 cents per transaction. The bank transfer, the 1% with a max of $10 per transaction. The PayPal, 2.9% plus 25 cents per transaction. So clearly those things you want to keep in mind as you're sending out uh, the invoices like we talked about in uh, a prior presentation. So in other words, if you're with a client that you work with a lot, you might try to maximize the payment option so you minimize the amount of fees, which in this case you might say, hey, look, could you pay me with a bank transfer? Or you might set up a bank transfer without the QuickBooks payments if you can if you think you can get a lower, you know, with a lower fee even than that. If you have the same bank or if you have a PayPal account uh, with with them or something and you want them to pay you directly PayPal to PayPal account or something like that if you think you can have uh, the lower fees. However, uh, if you have new clients or you have a, a lot of you know, different clients, then oftentimes it's easier to get a turnaround of the payments if you provide them as many payment options as you can because then the, it's more likely that they will have a payment option they are comfortable with and it's more likely they'll make a turnaround on the payment. So for now, however, before using the payment options, let's think about a system where we don't use the payment options and we just think about the normal invoicing and receive payments so that we can then uh, compare that to putting the payment options in place. Now, before we do this, one more thing to note, I'm gonna close this back out. If I hit the plus button up top, we're talking about the customer cycle here. So usually when we're in, when we're in a customer cycle, how you, how you deal with your customer cycle will depend on the type of industry that you are in. So uh, we're dealing with an industry here where we're, where we're thinking we have to send out uh, an invoice, but you might be in an industry where you have a cash-based system with sales receipts or possibly just using bank deposits. So for example, let's jump on over to the flowchart just to get an idea of this. This is the desktop flowchart. Uh, but it's just a nice flow chart to think about the customer or revenue or sales cycle, which is also applicable to the online system. And so this will help us to see how the, the payments are gonna be integrated into our accounting system. So notice that if you're in the type of business, like a gig work type of business, then, then you might have a very simplified uh, s format or structure or flow for revenue generation. For example, if you just get paid by YouTube, you're a YouTuber and you get paid by YouTuber, well, you're just gonna wait till YouTube pays you. You're not gonna send them an invoice. You're not gonna send them a sales receipt. They're just basically gonna give you a deposit and you might have a system where you wait till it goes through your bank and you might have bank feeds. So when the deposit goes through your bank, she'll see it as a deposit because it's an electronic transfer, you'll see it came from YouTube or whoever, you know, whatever, and you'll be able to add it as a deposit and the other side go into revenue. That would be the most simplified kind of method and you don't even need to send anything out to prompt them uh, to pay you. Uh, one problem with that, however, is that the deposit form isn't designed to record revenue. So you don't get as much detail on the sub reports breaking breaking out the information by customer and by item because the customer and items are usually tracked with these sales forms the sales receipts and the invoices now if you have a bit more complex system but possibly still a cash based one then you can imagine a cash register for example if you have a cash register in a restaurant or something like that then you get paid at the same point in time you do the work you provide the food at a restaurant they pay you at the same point in time and we typically use a sales receipt form in quickbooks to record that type of transaction the reason we don't just record a deposit usually is because oftentimes the transaction isn't going directly into your bank more and more we have electronic kind of transfers and whatnot but still, usually, oftentimes, you're going to get paid by some kind of processor, even if it's electronic, like a credit card or something. And then the financial institution dealing with the credit card is going to take that information, bundle it in some way, and then put it in your bank account. Or you might be selling cash kind of transactions uh, where you're going to say you're receiving cash transactions. And then at the end of the day, you're going to take that and put it into your bank in a lump sum whether it be electronic with credit cards 
or cash or some other kind of payment processor, we end up with a problem, which is that I might make a bunch of like $5 sales, but when I get the deposit finally hitting the bank in the actual bank, it's gonna be grouping those deposits together in some way, shape or form. So if I put my deposits into the bank account directly, I'm not gonna be able to reconcile the bank statement to my deposits very easily because the grouping of those deposits will be different. So one way to deal with that is we have this clearing account that happens. I have the sales receipts and then when I receive the payment, uh, uh, or, or the sales receipts are gonna go into an undeposited funds or funds to be deposited uh, clearing account. Then when I deposit them into the bank, either I take the cash and go to the bank in a lump sum deposit or the credit cards in some way are grouping them together. I wanna make sure that I use the deposit form grouping it in my system in the same grouping that it's gonna show up on the bank statement to make the bank reconciliation easy. That's gonna be one of the issues that come up. And then if I have an invoice situation, you have a similar situation, but now instead of doing the work at the same point in time, I did the work first, like an accounting firm, and, and notice the differences here are gonna be driven by the industry you're in. It's not like you can just pick willy uh, nilly, you know, <laughs> you're gonna have to, well, the accounting firm, this is how things typically work. You do the work first and then you bill the client oftentimes. So you did the work, you're gonna send out an invoice. The invoice is gonna be increasing accounts receivable, which now you're gonna have to track to make sure that they pay you. And the other side is going to revenue. No cash is impacted by the invoice. And then once the invoice has been received, they're gonna have to, they're gonna pay you in some way, shape or form. And so when they pay you, then we're gonna have the receive payment form, which is gonna reduce the accounts receivable because they've paid us now. And the other side is gonna go into either cash or I might have this same issue that we had with the sales receipt. I might need to put it into an undeposited clearing account because I might be collecting multiple payments on invoices during a day with things like credit cards or possibly cash transactions. So I need to be able to group them when I make the deposit into the checking account in the same format. So I might then have a deposit form taking it out of undeposited funds or funds to be deposited and putting it into the checking account in the same number, the same grouping as will show on the bank statement, making bank reconciliation easy. So th this issue of going from the invoice to the receiving payment, then to the deposit is what may be made easier if I've got my, my uh, payment automatically being collected, because then I would like the QuickBooks system to be able to say, record the receive payment and then uh, make the deposit in the proper grouping that it'll, it'll show up on the bank statement. So uh, if, if we were to, use the QuickBooks payments, we would typically send out like an invoice when they're gonna pay us and then allow them to pay, to pay us with some kind of payment uh, option on the invoice, or we could send out a link, right? A link, which would in essence, you know, create a sales receipt. Okay, so let's see what that process looks like in practice without the the payment. Uh, and, and then we'll see, and then we'll go back and do some and send some out with the payment option. So if I go new, and I did work and now I want to bill the client. So I'm going to bill them. I'm going to send them out an invoice. So we're going to send them out an invoice, hopefully hoping that they turn around and pay, of course, that invoice. I'll try to use this new format, even though I'm not completely used to it. All right. So we're going to add a customer down here. So I'm going to say add a customer and then I'm just going to make a generic name. I'm going to say company, company one generic name on the, the customer name and save it. So so uh, I'm, I'm putting the bare minimum. Obviously, if this was a repeat customer, you might want a lot more detail on the customer, but we're just doing uh, the minimum for the example here. So customer number one, there's the invoice. This is the term in terms of when we want to be paid. So we expect to be paid within net 30. So if the invoice date is 5-26-23, then 30 days later is when we expect to be paid uh, on 6-25-23. And okay, and then we have our tags. I'm not gonna add any tags here. And then our products, so we have the generic products uh, that, that have been 
given by QuickBooks. So I'm not going to deal with inventory at this point. I'm just going to use their service items. So I'll say hours and let's say there was one hour and let's just put like, uh, I'm going to do some fairly low dollar amounts, uh, $5 and there we have it. So we could have multiple line items on the invoice if we needed to add uh, another line item, for example, and, uh, and then we have the payment options down here. Now I'm going to try to say here, we're not going to use the payment options. So I'm going to go to the tab to the, to the right, and I'm just going to turn off all the payment options. So we're not going to use the payment options either because we're imagining we don't we didn't turn on the payment options. So we don't have them, or we have a situation where we're saying, Hey, look, I would like them to pay me in some other way that we have agreed on possibly send me a check. And then I can just deal with the check. Maybe I, I like that system. I don't deal with any fees on the check or you might give them some other format uh, to pay you. So you might, you might tell them uh, you could pay me PayPal to PayPal or something like that. If you think there would be less fees or bank feed uh, or, or your bank, if you have the same bank or something, you think there'd be less fees or something like that, uh, possibly other payment options that you could deal with in that way. So what's this going to do? This is an invoice. That means it's going to increase the accounts receivable. The other side is going to be going to uh, a revenue account for the $5. And then we're going to have to wait and receive the payment in whatever format they're going to give us the payment. So I'm going to, we can, we could still send it out if we had their email address uh, and they could still get it by email. They just don't have the link in the email in order to, to pay it in that way. We also have a, a link item, so I could do the link option as well. So that's a newer item here. We need the email address uh, uh, for that. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna say, uh, sa print, save it. So let's go over here and just save and close. Okay, and let's check it out. So if I go on to the, to the balance sheet and run this, now we have in the balance sheet, we've got our accounts receivable. If I drill down on that, then we're going to see our invoice. If I go into the invoice, then we see our invoice. Beautiful. Closing that back out, going back on over, exit in here. The other side's on the profit and loss. So if I run the profit and loss, there's our, our income that's being recorded on the profit and loss. We can also track the receivable, go into the first tab, and that's going to be under the, uh, the sales information. And we can look at all the sales stuff here and uh, track the amount that's due. And we have the customers on the right-hand side and I can track my customers this way as well. So let's do a couple of them. I'm actually gonna do another invoice and add another one so that we have a couple invoices so we can see that grouping of the payment problem. So I'm gonna tap through this again. And let's say we're gonna add another customer add a customer this will just be cus customer customer number two and again i would need the email address of course if i was going to email them the invoice which is quite common these days whether i'm using payments or not but i'm just going to close it for now we'll deal with that later and i'm going to keep everything up top the same and this one we'll say is ours but it's going to be four dollars for the hours just to switch things up here so this is going to increase the accounts receivable the other side's going to go to sales for the four dollars and my payment options i'm going to turn off the payment options so we don't have any payment options uh so there's the four dollars and then i'm just going to save and close it save and close it so we could still send it by email without the payment options and so on and so forth. So if I go back into the balance sheet and we refresh it, running it, now we've got the $9 in the accounts receivable, the five and the four. On the profit and loss, we've got the $9 in income. Back to the first tab, if I refresh this screen to see my customers, I should have uh, two customers now. There's our two customers. So now we are at this point, we made the invoice we have accounts receivables up uh, at this point in time. Now notice there's a couple things that could happen from here, depending on your workflow. Uh, they might, if they send, if you have a payment structure where they send you a check or they pay you through 
uh, your bank but not using the payments or something like that or they pay you paypal to paypal uh, or something like that then you're gonna have to enter the receive payment here now if you get a check or something you could you could easily you can enter that when you get the check or if you see something when they when it clears your bank account you can enter it at that point in time you might also just try to simply use your bank feeds so if they're using a transfer to from paypal to paypal or something or to your bank account you're going to see the deposit that is going to go into uh into your bank account so you might try to use the deposit to match up to uh to the invoices and that way you can you could try to connect your deposit to the invoice when they pay you so there's a couple methods now oftentimes if you if you're dealing with a situation where you don't send out like a whole lot of invoices so it's pretty clear and possibly higher dollar amount invoices so it's pretty clear when you get paid if it were an electronic transfer that the payment is should be attached to that particular invoice because of a unique dollar amount because there's not a lot of different payments then the system might be able to just match it out with uh with the bank feeds as the deposit comes through with an electronic checking account you can kind of connect it to the bank feeds but if you get paid by check or something like that and you have uh, different forms of payment then the next step would would be to to have the receive payment so let's use the receive payment option here the receive payment form notice if you if you connect directly to the bank and you use the bank feeds when you match up the bank fee transaction then then uh, QuickBooks will will basically make the receive payment and the deposit form for you in that kind of matching process. But let's imagine we got like a check or two checks or something like that, or it was paid and, and we're entering it as we go. So the next step would be that we're going to say receive payment. So let's say receive payment from customer number one. And so I'll go into that. Let's say this happens on uh, the 27th and the receive payment and there's the invoice down below so what's this going to do it's going to reduce the accounts receivable and the other side uh, is going to go actually into our checking account and we have it telling it that we want to put it into this uh, cash account at this point in time let's actually set up a, a a another checking well let's put it there i'll just put it to the cash account that's going to go into our cash account. So let's say save it and close it. Save and close. So if I go back on over here, we're going to say run this. And now we've got $5 in the cash account. Accounts receivable went down, is now down to the $4. And we see the activity that's happening here. The $5 went up with the invoice down with the payment. We're left with the $4. The other invoice going back on over. Exit nothing happened to the income statement when we actually received the payment it's still at nine dollars if i go back to the tab to the left let's do the same thing for the four dollars receive the payment and we'll say that happened also on the 27th and it's an invoice so this is going to increase our cash account the other side decrease in accounts receivable save it and close it tab into the right now we've got our, our cash account has the nine dollars which is like our checking account here tabbing to the right we've got nine dollars in the sales still so there we have that okay so now we're here in our process and uh and we we've got our receive payment form now notice what we did here is we put them both into the checking account directly so i put them directly into the into the checking account however if we were having credit cards or something like that uh, or if we were collecting cash transactions or something like that it might be problematic to put them directly into the checking account here because when I try to tie this out and reconcile to the bank account the bank account might have a lump sum of nine dollars whereas our checking account has two items and if you have a lot of transactions it could have many items that add up to that lump sum total making the reconciliation difficult that's when you would need the clearing account so to deal with that, let's show you that. I'm going to go back into this one here and show you the method to deal with that. It's usually we're going to put it into this payment to deposit account. So I went back in. I'm changing it to the payment to deposit instead of the cash account. Save it and close it. And then I'm going to do the same thing to the second one here. Uh, let's go back. Exit. So now let's go back into the cash account. 
and I'll do the same thing to the second one. So I'm gonna go into that number and I'm gonna say, I want you to make this go to the payment to deposit account, save it and close it and say yes. And so then I'm gonna go back on over exit. So now we've got $9 in the payments to deposit. And now if they were cash payments, I can imagine going to the bank with that lump sum $9, not $5 and $4 separately and putting it into the bank account at one lump sum. Or you can imagine a credit card or payment processor doing a similar type of thing electronically, taking all of your payments for a certain time period and putting it into the bank account as one lump sum. And that's the issue. That's one of the issues we often have to deal with that becomes a problem because if we're receiving the payments one invoice at a time and they hit our bank one invoice at a time, that's not a, that's fine. We can, we can then put it directly into the checking account. That's usually pretty clear. But if we have some kind of payment processor, like a credit card, or we're taking cash sales or some other payment processor that's grouping the payments before they hit our checking account, then we have this grouping issue that we want to be pointing out. Okay. So then the next step, then that would put us right here but we put it into undeposited funds. Now we're gonna make the deposit. So if I go back to the left-hand side and we say new, and I'm gonna say, let's make the deposit. The deposit form now is gonna show those two deposits. So I'm gonna check those two off, which now adds up to the $9. So what's this gonna do? It's gonna to deposit to the checking account, but not in the format of $5 and $4 separately, but one $9 amount, the $9 amount being the amount that's going to tie out to the lump sum deposit actually in the bank reflected on the bank statement. So I'm going to say save and new or save and close balance sheet, run it. So now we've got the $9 in the cash account, but it's in there with one deposit form, which means when we reconcile it, it'll be in there. It'll show that one deposit of the $9 exit. And then the other side, uh, decreased the payments to deposit. So it is back down again. So now that one is back down. Looks good. Okay. So you can see that if we have this, if we have this middle issue of having to group our deposits, uh, that becomes, that becomes a tedious task. So that's something to kind of deal with. If we have invoices that are being paid one at a time, and I can easily identify that one payment that's going into my checking account and tie it out to a particular invoice without having this grouping issue, which often arises with credit cards, some other payment processors and cash transactions, often for lower dollar amounts of sales that are gonna be grouped together in some bundling fashion. If I don't have to deal with that, then it's pretty easy to just receive the payment and tie it out. But if I have to deal with that bundling stuff, you can see that added step becomes a headache. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the general idea. Now, if you're, so if you're using the QuickBooks payments, it may allow us to alleviate that problem a little bit as well. So we have the cost of the QuickBooks payments that comes into play. So if I go back on over here and if instead, as we'll test out in the future presentations, we use the payment options and allow them to pay us with the QuickBooks payments. Now, because we're using the integrated QuickBooks payments, uh, we're gonna have the fee for it. So that's one thing to consider. But when they pay us, then hopefully QuickBooks will be able to automate some of the receipt processes, recording the receipt of the payment. And if there are bundling issues, be able to properly bundle the receipts that we're getting to put it into the checking account in the same grouping as we'll show on our bank statement, making the reconciliation process easy. So from, so, in comparison, then the invoice using the payment methods, one, it costs, it could cost more. So that's the downside, but on the plus side, it gives obviously the customer more payment options and which makes it easier for the turnaround possibly to happen. And if you have to deal with this issue of, of bundling payments in order to have a deposit that matches what's on the bank statement because of credit card bundling, payment processor bundling, or cash kind of, or bundling kind of system, then using the, the payment processor hopefully will allow 
into it to automate that system more easily so that when you get the payment in whatever format that they choose, they will properly, if they choose a credit card, for example, they will properly bundle the credit card payments that are that are ultimately going to be paid out to us, possibly for multiple invoices and whatnot, and and then allow it to hit the bank in the in the proper grouping so that the bank reconciliation will happen more easily. So we'll test out some of that uh, in future presentations.